Hey everyone and welcome to the Level Design Lobby. Today is another special episode because it is the second, yes, the second episode of Mine Analysis Q&A. Without further ado, let's get into it. Hey everyone, I hope you're doing well playing and or making the games that you love. As I said, this is the second episode of our Q&A and we're trying to turn this into a, uh, trying to make this into a routine, should I say. So we're trying to answer as much questions as we can and together. And as I said, we're, I'm joined by the brilliant and beautiful associate producer, Alex Partridge. Hello, nice to be back. It's good to have you back, mate. Uh, for those of you who've recently joined, Alex, or is unaware, Alex is the associate producer. So if you are a member of the Patreon, then you will recognize him as he's one of the admins, well, other than me, the only admin on there. And he's constantly communicating with a lot of you through Discord. And he's a great guy and, you know, just super happy to have have you here again, mate. No, yeah, thank you for having me again. Um, I'd obviously like to point out that um, if you want an introduction about myself, I would really urge you to go and listen to the first episode we did on community q a as it's all laid out there bare for you to see so go and listen yeah man that's it because his backstory his dark hidden past brooding and angst you know we don't want to say it again because it's too special to be repeated here <laughs> oh man so what have you been up to you doing all good man yeah i'm doing just fine same as ever always just chugging away on projects things like that so yeah, nothing to complain about here. Awesome, man. How the, I know you can't say too much about the projects, but they're coming on well. You feeling the progression with them? I think, um, is generally speaking, yes. Obviously, you sort of stall occasionally with some things, but um, you know, you sort of make baby steps forward and you sort of overcome the problems eventually. And that's just what I've been doing. Awesome, man. That's great to hear. So, as I said to everyone, we're going to do an answer more questions. So, why don't we take a deep dive into those questions then, mate? Mm -hmm. Obviously, I'd like to say a uh, big thank you to anyone who has posted uh, any questions to us, either via email, Twitter, or where most of them have come from on the community Discord. So thank you very much for those. And we shall start with a question from Water Malone. And he has asked, how has your experience in AAA development been so far? Do you enjoy it and see yourself staying there? Or do you think you might go indie at some stage? Oh, well, that's a that's a really good question there. Uh, so far, I've loved it. Don't get me wrong. There has been some uh, some low points in terms of things like like anything. You know, I I don't believe with I don't believe that quote which goes, "If you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life." I don't believe that. I think no matter how much you love something, there's always going to be some time where some sort of stress creeps in. But overall, I love it. Like I don't, I couldn't imagine me doing anything else. This is what I love to do, hence me not only working at AAA, but then doing a podcast, writing articles, or working on my personal stuff. This is this is just what I love. So I don't don't see myself leaving the game industry at all. Uh, as for going indie, I don't know yet. That's a, it's a great question. It, it has crossed my mind, but I have no intention in the near future. I think there's still so much for me to learn. And that's why I want to keep going with AAA for, I don't, I don't know when, but I still think there's a lot to learn. Even as India, I know there'll be stuff to learn there for sure, but there's, there's still a lot to learn here. And as I said, overall, it's been amazing. Like the experiences I've had, I've got to, the, got the good fortune to travel the world while making video games. That, yeah, that's incredible. Some of the most amazing people I've met, like Alex himself, it's all through video games, you know, so I love it. I do genuinely love it. Like I said, there are low moments, but that's normal. That is honestly normal. I think in general as well, um, indie is a bit more inherently uh, risky, just in terms of uh, the monetary side and the production side, things like that. So, uh, you know, the sort of the fact that you're saying, you know, oh, you know, I want to try and learn as much as possible before that is absolutely the best way to do it. Because the more you know going into indie in terms of development practices and, you know, best practices, things like that, the, the better chances you have of succeeding once you're there. So, yeah, no, I absolutely agree. Yeah, no, I think you bring some valid points about the the risk of indie. I think that's a, it's one thing that people kind of forget as well. And what I mean by forget is 
especially if you're a small man team, part of your team needs to, and it's not always the, the fun bit when you're the creative type, is to focus on the marketing, the, the planning, budgeting, and all that stuff, which sometimes us as devs, well, most of the time as us as devs, don't have experience with. And I think that's a whole other realm, uh, you know, that me personally, I don't understand. I've taken a few marketing classes for games, but it seems like a whole new uh, world. Maybe it's worth us chatting to some sort of marketing people at some point for later in the episode, but you know, there's some great points you added on, Alex. And that's without even mentioning or even talking about the whole f- the financial side and mm. where you get your funding from and how you go about procuring that funding. I mean, obviously, a lot of people nowadays use crowdfunding and stuff like that, but it's still not a guaranteed way to get your project off the ground. So, yeah, very, very risky to do, but could be a very rewarding experience to have if you manage to make it. For sure. I, I just want to ask you a question on top of uh, what you just said there, Alex. <laughs> go on, go Sorry, on. Sorry, uh, we've, uh, we've built this question to be bigger. But you, as you just pointed out, uh, crowdfunding seems to be a, a big source of, of building up a finance for the game. How long or do you think this will continue forever? I know you don't, you know, you, you've not had a project kickstarted no, or anything, no. but I'm just curious, do you think there's longevity in crowdfunding? I think so long as people are making products that others are willing to pay for, as is there's the nature of sort of capitalism really um i think and as long as that people are looking for projects or looking for ways to get their projects off the ground i don't particularly or personally see crowdfunding going anywhere anytime soon but obviously the sort of successes you have compared to the amount of people who go into crowdfunding as their sort of main avenue of revenue and funding for their projects is is massively reduced compared to the you know the people who uh, I'm trying to think how to say it you know the, the success stories you get is sort of mm. uh, massively less than the total sum of people who actually go into it so you know but as long as people are willing to believe in products that um, people are trying to advertise and put out and want to make then i don't personally see it going anywhere mm. no, that's, that's an interesting thought on it for sure man for sure cool i'm, well, I'm glad we got like multiple questions in one there <laughs> what's the next one my man so the next question comes from Braxy or Brad Butcher on the LDL community, and he has asked, how long do you typically spend on each section of production? Paper planning, block out, iterating, art pass, etc. How long is too long before you need to move on to the next stage? That is a, <laughs> a very tough one, because sadly a lot of this will come down to production in terms of how long you'll get to spend on things, where... Sometimes we've had to skip the paper design section completely due to time constraints of the project, which is obviously a shame and is not something that we we want to do. So it doesn't really always come down to the LD to decide. But I will say you should make time for these. To me, especially like your research and your iterating, uh, to me, are some of the most important. Obviously, the block out is very important, but... Each time you iterate, it's only going to get better. So if you skipped that, I think that would be worse. If you skipped the research and like planning, then what you'd make would kind of be wasted as well. So sadly, there isn't there isn't an answer I can give because as I said, it mainly comes down to production on this one. But you should, while you have the chance and if you have the chance, try to take as much time on these as you can. Too much time? Oh man, like if you spent, so like say for example, four months just paper designing a level, I think you'd start to go backwards at some point. Uh, as for like, what's the perfect scale for it? I couldn't tell you because also this depends on the scope that you're making. I'm really sorry that's not a great answer to to the questions, but that's that's kind of how it is really when it when it comes to things. I think by um, just doing these different types of development in different ways, you know, in the terms of its process, I think you like you you sort of alluded to there. You know, like uh, one is not a guarantee you know you could design it something on paper like for four months and you know you can try and shift it over to um, the next stage but y- you could find that um you know what you were your ideas and designs don't necessarily translate well or work well once they've hit the next stage so you know you've got really got to i'd say sort of evaluate it yourself and just do what feels right for you 
Um, again, it's like Max said, it's not really an exact answer, but it's something that I usually play by ear if I'm working on my own projects. Um, I sort of have a, a bit of an inkling as to whether I know whether I need to spend more time or less time on certain sections. And sometimes, you know, if I'm fairly confident, I know what I want. I, you know, I will sometimes even skip sections entirely. Um, it, it depends entirely down to what the uh, project you're working on needs or what you think it needs. So not an exact answer, but an answer yeah, nonetheless. Yeah, I completely agree, man. So yeah, we apologize. We can't do something more specific, but and also I think uh, is is you just building on what you said as well. It's like when you said you know you sometimes you'll skip certain parts when you, you know you figured out what you want. It depends on the designer as well. I know people who don't do any paper design; they just quickly just block something out as quick as possible. And then I know some designers who like to do a ton of paper design, ton of drawings. You know, like eventually you'll find your groove on what you think is important for your design process as well but you know please 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 for the love of god do not skip the research or the iteration phase mm, like no you know the, the block out obviously is important because when you make it but those to me are some of i don't want to say the most important because i think each of them plays a role just they will help you from making mistakes in the future now that we got that one nailed down by not answering the question. <laughs> Hit us with another one, Alex. What is the third question? The third question, Max, comes from Shaq. And Abe asked, how do you balance personal life with work life? So yeah, Shaq sent this to me in an email, so I hope he don't, doesn't mind me sharing this. But I think it was a great question, and I really wanted to bring this up. And I think people need to be aware that in this industry, crunch is a thing. That is for sure. It happens and I don't want anyone to be deluded by it and it will also be some of the down points if crunch goes forever like I don't want to sugarcoat things for you so I think that question is a great one um, and it's a tough one to answer because as Alex will attest to like I have not got it right I need to figure this one out for my own self but I think it's important that you do go home and you do see the people like from your from your friends and your family quite a bit or just talk to them because you will need to make the best levels. You will need to take inspiration from everywhere and a happy worker is the best worker. So don't neglect that. I've also seen in my times a lot of divorces come through or breakups happen because of working hours. And I don't want to see that happen to any, any of you, any of the listeners or just anyone in general. And, and that'd be the problem, you know, I think it it is something that people need to talk about more because people are aware that crunch is in the industry, but no one's talking about solutions. And I'm not saying we're going to find the solution here because it's a tough one and there's so many factors that go into it. But what I will say is this, is do not undervalue or underappreciate your personal life because you need that as many elements of, the, of that to make you happy. So it's going to be on you and there's going to be times where things just automatically go out of balance where you might spend more time with your partner than you are working or that work takes a bit more priority than you going off to see your family but just be careful that it doesn't always stay askew for the, for long periods of time guys i'm trying to schedule my life in terms of you know scheduling what i do on certain days i'm going to see how that goes uh, i've taken up meditation for a, a couple of years and i really enjoy that and that helps me with things. But it's a tough one. And if I knew the answer, I'd let you guys know. But find what works for you and just don't don't miss those things in life. Because making games is awesome. As we answered one of the questions earlier, I love it. But it doesn't mean you have to miss out on the rest of your life. As Max has said, you know, personal and work-life balance is such an important thing. And it's something that the vast majority of people, and even people outside of the games industry, don't get right. It's an extremely hard thing to do. And if this and other sort of things that arise from this, things like mental health problems, is something that I think we could easily devote an entire episode to talking about because it is such a massive issue Um especially now um and people are talking about it and that's great but you just need to make sure you find what works for you and you need to realize that you are not a robot you are a person you need the time you spend not doing anything not working is just as important as the time you spend doing and working on the things that you love so 
and as Max said, a, a happy worker is a good worker and you will always produce your best work when you're in a good state of mind and you are looking after yourself both mentally and physically. So please make sure you do that. Like me, I genuinely mean that when we say that, like do look after yourselves. Like I know we've got the Discord for just chatting about games, but if you're ever feeling down about something bring that, and you're on the Discord, please bring that up to us. Yeah, no. Like as Max said, if you are feeling down, if you are struggling, please don't suffer in silence. Do say something because talking about it, as much as you may think it won't, it will help. And there are people around you in all corners of your lives, even those you may not think, who understand what you are going through. And yeah, just talk about it, please. Don't don't suffer in silence. Yeah, this community is more than just games, obviously. Like we, you know, just an example, uh, one of our members, Snow, just had an interview and he told us he's going for it. And like the amount of support that he got and hopefully he felt from the community was incredible for me to just see because we're cheering each other on so we're here for the highs and we're here for the lows guys so really do as alex says don't suffer in silence if you love game and level design as much as we do then why not consider supporting level design lobby on patreon patreon is a crowdfunding platform that allows people to directly fund the content and creators that they love from as little as one dollar per month You can help support us in our mission to unite and teach people across the world about the wonderful and unique field of game and level design, and get some great reward perks in return, such as access to the Level Design Lobby Community Discord, bi-monthly webinars, Level Design Weekends, and much more. So head on over to patreon.com forward slash leveldesignlobby for more information and to pledge your support today. Finally, we'd just like to say a massive thank you to all our current backers. It's thanks to the generous support of people like you that we are able to grow and can continue to bring you awesome, new, and exciting content. So thank you. And now back to our regularly scheduled program. And on that uh, kind of more (laughs) serious tone, we'll try liven it up with the next question. What is it, my man? So we have another question from uh, Braxy, Brad Butcher, and he has asked where you're starting from scratch on a new level. How do you generate those early ideas? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Uh, there's obviously a lot that comes into this, like what type of game, understanding that. But a lot of it will come from like research. You know, go find those reference images. I must have mentioned reference images in so many of my podcast episodes now. It's really important. So really do go find those because you're going to get some amazing ideas from that alone. Also, some of the locations probably take, uh, take place, sorry, in real life locations. So you are more than likely going to have a memory or a certain kind of layout in your head from something you've experienced. So a lot of that can come into things, you know? So generally take it from reference and then you take it from your kind of experience. That's where a lot of it for me starts. And then I start to think where I can push it. You know, once I kind of have a foundation of where I'm going, well, how do I push it? How do I push the crazy on top of that? That's how it generally goes for me. How about you, Alex? How do you find it? I think for me, when I'm designing levels, um, the sort of the first question I usually ask myself is, what's going on here? And what do I want to get out of this level in terms of the player's experience? And this is going to sound very, very cliche, and I'm going to probably sound a bit like a university lecturer saying this, but um, mind mapping is probably one of the best tools you can use to really eke out some ideas, especially if you're struggling. Um, Just laying out your ideas in front of you is a great way to see what's good, what isn't, what works, what doesn't. And I use a whiteboard, and that's great because it's just a mental dumping ground to just put everything on that you're thinking about. And there's something sort of affirmative and very gratifying about scrubbing out the ideas that are no good. And again, it's a bit cliche, but people find what works for them and another thing that works for me as well is is I'm a a big sort of arty sort of creative person I like to draw so I do a lot of sketching I do a lot of just rough drawings and bits and pieces just to just to start getting those er very early shapes and images down onto paper or onto into photoshop really helps me um, get ideas down and sometimes those ideas come out in what I would consider sort of 60% completedness form. And sometimes they come out uh, in a very rough way. But 
again, it's just finding what works for you and we're probably being a bit vague again and non-specific, mm. which I'm really sorry about. But again, it's all about finding what works for you and especially in the context of the way you work. You're just right. And I think just building on your first point about like understanding what's happening in the level, you're going to be, if it's if you're working, for example, with a quest designer or you know what's happening in the level yourself, make sure that that's a key thing for you, that you do know what that space is for because that's going to help you design it as well. Awesome, dude. What's our, our next one? Our next question comes from Paul uh, Gillar. I hope I've said your name correctly. I apologize if I haven't. Um, and he has asked, when is it recommended to use modular pieces and non-modular pieces in level design? I, keep, I don't know why. I've, I've nearly answered every question with like a massive sigh of breath. I'm sorry. He's tired of I'm your just questions. Trying to think that's of the... what it is. Yeah, that's it. I'm like, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> my gran always told me I was a failure and here we are. <laughs> We're not. Obviously, Paul, this is a great question. Um, so yeah, back to, uh, to, to the question. So this is a really interesting one. Generally, it's best to use modular pieces, especially in AAA. What you'll find is a lot of the times you'll be given like kind of these kit pieces to to construct your levels with, so that way it sticks to the uh, the metrics and and that. So I think that is a uh, journey at hand because when your artist comes to take over, it's better. It's better for them. Uh, if, for example, though you are creating something in a terrain kind of plane but you don't have a terrain editor, then using non-modular pieces and scaling things up and around to make these more abstract abstract shapes is fine as well. It's probably more encouraged. And if you're trying to make more kind of, you know, shapes that maybe you can't make with these LD kit pieces, for example, then go for it. As long as you keep it where it's not crazy and you talk to your artist, you'll, you should generally be fine because it'll change a bit when a, when the artist comes to take over. But I'd say try use them when you can because it helps and smooth things over for the artist as to like using the grid wood as well and snapping to that. But don't let that constrain you. If you need to, to make something and get the point across, then go use and scale things how you want to do it. In the context of sort of more personal production, the sort of work that you might be doing at home, I would say that it's absolutely all right to use modular pieces whenever you find or want to demonstrate something that you can't make yourself so if you want to be able to walk around your level and show it off to people and you don't know how to code your own player controller for example it's absolutely fine to go ahead and use a pre-made player controller whether it be from unity or unreal's uh, asset stores that's fine you're a level designer we're not expecting you to be a coder or a or an artist and when you work in triple a and sort of industry roles there will be people to make those assets for you so you need the focus for you should be on finding the way the best way to show and demonstrate your work off and if that requires using components that other people have made as long as you credit them especially if it's made by third-party artists and not the engine builders themselves um, I think that's absolutely fine and you shouldn't be afraid to use that. Yeah, man. Agreed. Agreed. So we hope that answers your question, Paul. And as I said, the jokes were not made at your expense there, sir. So we hope you don't feel that, my man. And great to have you and all everyone else answering questions. I obviously do like these before people think that I don't. So <laughs> I do enjoy these. I'm just trying to make sure I give you a good answer when I l relieve a, a big puff of air. That sounded weird saying puff of air. I don't know why. Just roll with it, Max. Next question. <laughs> so the next question comes from Harvey Yang, and he has asked, for regular AAA production, is coding knowledge nice to have or pretty much mandatory? If the latter, what languages are best to start with? I'm presuming uh, Harvey must be asking this in terms of as a level designer, um, just because if you are applying for a programming job, then yes, it's mandatory there. But for a level designer, it's more of a nice to have thing. I do personally recommend it because that's what's made me stand out when I've applied for certain jobs is the fact that I can script it helps. But there's friends I know who have over X years experience 
who are not the best at scripting or you know or any language and they can get on just fine but i would recommend it because i think it's really important However, with a lot of level designers these days, we use a lot of visual scripting, such as Blueprint, or you have the plugin in Unity called Playmaker, all these sort of things that, that are there. So I recommend it because I, I like the way it makes your mind think. So I, I would say go for it. If you're looking for something to start, I think there's no better place to start than either Unity with C Sharp, or you can use uh, Game Maker, which has their own kind of scripting language. But it's very simplified, so you still understand how things work, and it gets your brain working in the right way. Uh, but it's, it's as I said, a bit more of a simplified language in terms of things. So I recommend them. I think they're great. It's good. If you are wanting to go into more of a technical role, which I know, uh, for example, our member 13th Cat, that's something that she's she's focused on a, a fair amount, and I think that's a current role as well. I was doing some technical level design at Ubisoft as well. If you are planning to do that, then do do as much scripting as you can. But for your for your traditional level design role, I wouldn't worry too much. But I do encourage it personally. I think the uh, studios that don't use or employ flow graph type systems, um, some of them use a language called Lua. Yes. I've not used it personally myself, but I know it's sort of quite simple to learn. Um, mm -hmm. I've been reliably informed by a programmer friend of mine that even I could learn it and I'm not particularly um, technically minded um, I'm more creative myself but saying that um, I did take the time to build up a sort of skill set using C sharp in relation to unity and that's been an absolutely brilliant skill to have under my belt I'd say um, it's allowed me to do prototyping work myself um, you know, there's still a lot of research I have to do whenever I am programming things. And, you know, I'm not by any means a uh, encyclopedia of programming. There are still a lot of things I don't know. But I personally say that it has actually benefited my workflow and given me a much better understanding of how the overall game development process works and how everything needs to work together and knit together so if you haven't i would absolutely encourage you to start obviously it will vary dependent on what engine you're using if you're a fan of unreal for example you will be leaning more to c plus plus um which i think is a little bit sort of more hands-off compared to c sharp you mm. have to do more yourself um i won't get into details here but obviously i think you just need to google around and you will easily find the uh, all the info you need on those and what's great nowadays is that there's um, lots of resources um, and tutorials especially on places like YouTube if you are wanting to learn a language or programming from scratch you are in absolutely great hands there and they often break the concepts down and talk about them in very simple and easy to understand ways and I'm living proof of that I'm an artist I'm a creative and I can program so if I can do it I would say anyone can do it. Yeah, man. No, I agree. It's cool. Okay, guys and girls, this will be the final question of the episode. And for those who, again, uh, may not have heard their questions answered here, don't worry, we are getting around to them. We do have a whole list here, which Alex has been kind enough to set up so we know which ones we need to answer next. So don't worry, we will get around to these. And what is the last one, Alex? So the final question for this episode, again, comes from Brad Butcher, and he has asked, do you have any methods or techniques when nearing the completion of a level to take it from something good to something great, that last bit of polish? Mm. That's a good one. That's a, that's a really good one. I think for me, uh, the last thing, probably things that I try to add, well, first you need to make sure this thing's being play tested because that is going to show a lot. And I think that's what helps you actually add that final bit is through playtesting by seeing how the player reacts to your level. Another thing I try to do, but this isn't at the end, this is kind of midway through the development, is I try and ask myself, what's the crazy thing? What is crazy? And what I mean by that, and I got this from a friend, um, Graham, who is a senior level designer at Ubisoft. He, uh, he has one of the most creative minds in terms of, how he builds things like then then anyone i've probably met he constantly pushes the crazy and that's something that i try i try to live by as well now 
is so if I'm partway through, I'm like, okay, this is, let's just say, for example, a supermarket. I'm like, okay, and I've made it. It's got some cool combat, something like that. But what's the crazy in it? How do I make this better? Is there something I can add? Like, I don't know, there's a certain toy robot on sale, which now becomes the boss battle that can now change the level, that sort of thing. Or is it how the enemies enter through the roof, something like this? Or can the player construct a deadly weapon out of a trolley cart which the players have to use to navigate through it's these sort of things that i will try ask to try and make something better and not all of these will go through i'm well aware of that but i find it far better if someone's like max let's rein in these ideas than them trying to push me to do more so my best one of my best ones is push the crazy play test the heck out of it like seriously you need to be play testing this because this will help uh, last bits of polish is making sure the player understands what's going on. Try play that game, that level without any UI. Get rid of it and see how the player reacts there. Because if they can follow certain things, like if you can lead their eyes in certain ways, like some of you may have seen my tweets with, if you're in a corridor, how do you pull someone, such as blocking certain routes, or angling a certain corner, these sort of things, which to me can help make something even better. So I strongly recommend those. Those are my tips. Well, guys and girls, that will wrap up this episode for us. We just wanted to say again, a huge thank you for the support and just listening to us. We really, really do appreciate it. If you do want to, if you're new and you do want to support and get more involved with the community, you can do that. There will be links to that in the description down below. And if you want to get to... Uh, contact with me you can do so through the power of twitter at max pairs or you can email into the show level design lobby at gmail.com anything you want to add alex my man as always i will be lurking around on the uh, ldl community discord should you need me i am at firestrider or if you perhaps feel like tweeting at me not that i tweet particularly much um i am at alex m partridge and i will be happy to hear or listen to anything you have to say Awesome. So thank you again, everyone, for your questions. We hope you've enjoyed the answers. And as I said before, do not worry. We will get around to them. So thank you for your patience. And do understand that we are not neglecting anyone's questions. We will get back to you. So take it easy, everyone. And we'll catch you all next time. Bye.